Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Musar class. I'm so happy to have you guys with us tonight. Um, you know, we're um, just coming out of Hanukkah and, you know, the world's had their holidays going on. And so people are off and on vacation. So I'm hoping everybody's able to get to join us and, 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 or watch later. That would be great. Um, tonight, if you guys remember, we are starting chapter four. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Ooh. Um, actually, let's see. Nope, wrong button. Okay, give me just a minute. I have to pull up the thing that, because that's the way this software works. Okay, so that needs to get there and then I can do, all right. Sorry, everybody talking to myself. That doesn't help. Now I'll try. Yay, there it is. Okay, so sharing my screen with you guys. And we're going to go ahead and make this into our slideshow. Beautiful. All right. Okay, good. So tonight we are starting chapter four. You are not who you think you are. Now, those of you who were with us for the last book that we did, the You Revealed book, some of this is going to sound a little familiar because we talked about the same topic last time, but just from a slightly different perspective. And I actually think that the two perspectives of both of these books go together very very well. So one thing you might want to do at some point is to, as you read through this one, go back through the You Revealed book and start putting things together and it'll, it's going to, a lot of things will pop out at you. All right. So if we're not who we think we are, then who are we? Um, let me see. Can you guys see all of that? Yes. Okay, good. Um, what do you think? When you think of the word ego, and of course, my ego word is hiding in my black arrow. I'm so sorry about that. Um, some people think, you know, an arrogant person. Some people think someone who's full of themselves. Um, some people think, you know, like in psycho psychological views of their id, their ego, and their super ego. A lot of people have different views when it comes to the word ego, but the traits usually assigned to ego are arrogant and full of yourself, um, self-focused, that kind of thing. Um, in Deuteronomy, our author says that there is a verse that states, it is I that stands between you and God. And yes, this is a verse where Moses is talking about how he is standing between the people of Israel and, and God, and basically being that mouthpiece because the people asked him to. Um, however, if you take it to a deeper, a deeper meaning, it, it's the actual, if you look at the actual words, it's I <laughs> who is standing in between you and all that is true you and God. So it's your ego. Your ego is standing between you and God. Okay. And the reason I chose this picture is because on one side, you have all the beautiful colors. And on the other side, it's like the earth, right? It's uh, the muddy colors. And it just made me think, you know, who's the real you? And that's a question that we're going to be talking about a lot tonight. <laughs> okay. So we have this interesting concept here. One to two to one to two. So let's talk about what he um what he's gonna start talking about that fits this weird little ratio thing here. And just to give a shout out, um, when I was looking for um a picture that would describe the Yatahara, I found this beautiful picture called um Hasidish. Yetzer Hara by Sarah Sanchez. And I thought, what a perfect picture for this slide. Um, okay, so our author says that the altar of Kelm would say that in the beginning, there was one voice. 
Then there were two. Now there is one. Our first step is to, at the very least, return to two voices. So that's our one to two to one to two. Okay. So let's talk about this. In the beginning of our lives, there was only one voice. That was the voice of your soul, your conscience, right? And then as you grew, you started to develop the voice of your ego. Your And the Torah refers to the ego as your Yetzirahara. That was a connection I had never made before. So I was like, oh, wow. Okay. That makes sense. As we grow, we lose touch with the voice of our soul and only left with that voice of our ego, our Yetzirahara, who gets us into all kinds of trouble, right? I want this. I've got to buy it. And then you find out, oh, I bought that thing and now I can't pay my bill. See, all kinds of trouble. <laughs> Our job, though, is to start recognizing that there are two voices and that this is the first step on our journey home. One of the reasons I really appreciated uh, Sarah Sanchez's picture here is that you have the same person, but you have the full colorful one, the life, right? And then you have the one that has all the shades of, of blue and darkness. And it's like, it's not that we want to completely expunge ourselves of our Yatahara, but we need to get it in balance, which is, my friends, again, the whole point of Musar, right? To balance our Midot. Well, when you're balancing out your Midot, you're putting your you're putting your Yatahara into check. You know, you see you're balancing out that Yatahara. We want to have more of the color in life, but that Yatahara is still there for a reason. So let's find out some more about our Yatahara. What is the ego? Yay. <laughs> In this context, your ego is your false sense of self. It's when you experience yourself as merely a body that you that can feel and think and nothing more. So it's like all about eating, all about what I want to do, how I want to feel, um, the thoughts I want to think about. It's the sense of being disconnected from everything in reality, including God. Think about that for a minute. How many times do people talk about loneliness, talk about not being able to connect, talk about um, not being satisfied, talk about achieving something, but still feeling unfulfilled. All of those things are talking about ego, right? In the ego state, you believe that you are only the sum total of the story of your life, the events you experience, your personality, your social networks, all your talents or lack thereof. And this isn't the whole truth. It's only a very small fraction of who you are. In fact, most of who you are isn't even in your body. So let's talk about this for a minute. Most of who you are isn't even in your body. We're looking at here um, a picture of the um, Sephirot. And I looked high and low because to find a picture of the Sephirot anymore that is in English and doesn't have a whole bunch of crazy stuff on it that I didn't, didn't understand, <laughs> but kept it simple, <laughs> was very difficult. But the fact of the matter is that your soul is not 100% in your body. Very part of your soul is in your body. And we are all in this bottom part down here, Malchut, right? We're in the part where we are able to create. We have the, we, like we talked about before, the, the nefesh is in your blood. Your ruach is your spirit. And it also comes out of your mouth, right? Your neshema is your holy soul from God. And it's the one that when you go to sleep at night, it goes up to God and tells them all the stuff you did during the day and then comes back in the morning when you wake up. Um, then you have another one that's outside of your body and another one that is still with Hashem. So if you kind of think about it as like, you got, you've got the nefesh down here at the bottom, you kind of make it up around this area, you've got your ruach and you make it up to here, you've got your neshama, you make it up to about here, you have the one on the outside of your body and then up here is the very top one. 
um, that is connected to God. Okay. So let's keep going. Yay. So let's talk about this yet to her. You guys are in for some surprises. All right. So the Yetzirahara or the ego is literally the, uh, the little definition of Yetzirahara is the creative force that is under, underdeveloped, undeveloped, an immature perspective. Think about that for a minute. Immature. I started looking <laughs> for immature on, uh, for pictures and it became apparent that all that I was going to see is pictures of children. And while that's all cute and fun and everything, it doesn't quite convey everything that immature should convey. Right. So um, that's why I chose this one because it's more of a diagram that pulled out some nifty little details. Like someone who is immature is rigid and single-minded. Um, I remember having one of the hardest times of my life when I was 18, 19 years old, because my perspectives on things were so narrow. It's like I had blinders on and I couldn't open up my, my thinking to accept or embrace new things. I was like, no, this is how it has to be. And then, in fact, at one point, I think I got in an argument with one of my roommates about how to make spaghetti because she was doing it wrong. I mean, come on, guys, everybody makes spaghetti their own way, you know? So, no, it's just one of those things. It's just like, wait a minute, how how rigid am I at that point, you know? Um, low stress tolerance, like, you know, something happens and they freak out, right? Oftentimes, our younger generations get criticized for not being able to handle things. Well, of course not. They're young. Okay. Um, do what feels best. Oh yeah. Most, most young people are, it's all about what feels right. Right. They don't, they don't go beyond that long-term into the long-term. They think just right here, right now, what feels right. Um, self-referential. They always want to talk about what's going on with them and their self. And rarely do they really ask about other people and what other people are doing. They're always trying to talk about themselves. Um, we see, we also have egocentric, uh, self preoccupied or involved. So we kind of did that already, um, subjective and not objective. So everything is very much, um, from their bias rather than from an objective observable data type of source. And then, um, they like being the center of attention and, they have a very low ability for empathy and, and they tend to be a little insensitive. This is immature. So if you think about these qualities, but instead of thinking about your teenager <laughs> or your grandchild or your, you know, your um, son or daughter or whatever, you want to think about this when it comes to your Yitzhara. And if you think about all of these qualities that we just listed off, are they not the same kind of qualities that we're trying to balance with, by studying Musar, right? By relating to life only through your Yetzirah or your ego, it gives you a false perception of reality. Well, why is that? Because of all these things. When you're only looking at your navel, your navel gazing, you're not going to see what's going on around you. And there's that one saying, I mean, it's a really old one, but you know, that person can't see the forest for all the trees. You know, they're so focused on one tree. They can't see anything else, but then you have the reverse of that. That person can't see the trees for all the forest. You know, there's so, you know, so it's either you're focused on the big picture too much that you can't see the individual or you're focused on the individual too much. You can't see the big picture. Well, usually an immature person is so focused on the individual, they can't see the big picture. Um, and that, so it does alter your perspective quite considerably when you can only see a small purview of what's going on. And if you think about it, why is it that we can't see a very big picture? Well, that would probably be because we're not God. <laughs> you know, we we don't have... One, the ability to the net necessity 
to know every last little detail of every last little thing to understand why this had to happen like this instead of that and that and the other, right? But God knows all those things. And so this is where that comes back to trusting him, that bit of coon. Are we going to have the trust in Hashem that even though I don't really understand why the economy is going the way it is and why I don't seem to have enough money every month and all of that, that I know Hashem is going to make sure I can make it somehow, some way, right? Okay. So <laughs> it's just an example. Um, this is the same way that a young person is not able to reason and understand the same way that an adult does. Okay. So just in the same way that a child can't understand, no, you can't eat candy all day. It will make you sick to your stomach. And adult understands that because probably they got sick one day eating too much candy, to be honest. Um, but it's the same way with our Yatahara and, and our soul, right? Our soul is, is from Hashem. Our soul is perfect. It knows all the things. But our Yatahara doesn't. And it's immature and undeveloped. Okay. As long as you continue to think in this small and narrow way, you will likely continue to choose short-term pleasure over long-term pleasures. So think about that for a minute because short-term pleasures are the here and now. And there is something I had figured out when I was a young twenties. Um, I don't want some short-term fun thing to end up ruining all of eternity. <laughs> you know, I wanted that short-term pleasure to only not only affect, you know, positive things in the short term. I want the, I want to build up the merits for the long term, right? You want to do the things that are going to put the money in the spiritual bank so that you have all that to look forward to. Um, and that's why it's one of the things I like about our prayers in the morning. You know, when we go through um, and we're doing the prayer for reading the Torah and um, we get to the part where we're actually going through different passages and we go through the part that talks about, you know, these are the, these are the things that we can do that have uh, the principle remains intact for us in the world to come, but we still get to have some of the pleasure of those things here in this world. And there are things like honoring your father and mother and, you know, um, providing a, dow a dowry for a bride and escorting the dead and Torah studies above all of them, right? We get the benefit of it here in this world in Mahut, but we also get benefit of it in the world to come. So it's that kind of thing, having that long-term view. It, am I going to be willing to engage in things in this world that have that long-term impact, or am I only going to be looking for that little bag of candy? Um, and the more that you identify, uh, or sorry, the more you more identified you are with this voice, the more you will naturally avoid anything that could indicate that the voice is wrong. So this voice being your ego, the more that you identify with your ego, the less likely you will do anything or venture near anywhere that says your ego's wrong. Why is that? Well, because your ego doesn't want to die. I will tell you that it does not want to die and is very afraid of that and tries to steer you. So let's talk about the ego's self -per preservation thing here. Um, the ego will do everything in its power to keep you distracted from what's truly important. If you were to prove an old perspective wrong, that would mean your ego's death. And when you identify with your ego, there is part of you that fears your own ego death. The ego recognizes this threat and in your subconscious, it works very hard at sidetracking you from the truth. And recognizing the voice of the ego is the first step on your journey home. So let's talk about this ego for a minute. <clears throat> a 
According to Dr. Wayne Dreyer in his book, The Power of Intention, it says that there are six main characteristics of the ego. I am what I have. I am what I do. I am what others think of me. I am separate from everyone. I am separate from everything missing in my life. And I am separate from God. So literally all those things are lies. Okay. You are not what you have. And you are not what you do. And you are not what others think of you. And you're not separate from everyone. You are, whether you like it or not, a part of all of life. And you are uh, not separate from everything that's missing in your life. And you are definitely not separate from God. The ego is simply an idea of who you are that you carry around with you. So let's talk about that for a minute. Let's talk about the perspective that you have of yourself. And so the two pictures that I have here is one of the kitty cats, right? You have the one cat who's looking in the mirror that looks like it drowned. And you have another picture of the kitty cat that's looking in the mirror that looks like a lion. Okay, hold on just a second, everybody. Let me see here. Sorry, everybody. My son um had to come tell me something really quick. Go on. Oh, okay. So in the first picture, the kitty cat who looks like he's a drowned rat and the other one, he looks like he's lying. But if you notice, both the cats are the exact same cat. And how many days do you wake up and you think, oh my gosh, I am so much that drowned cat. And other days you're like, ha, I've got the world by the, you know, by the, the scruff of its neck. I, I am the lion today. In the picture below that, we have an apple that's obviously been eaten, but when the apple is looking in the mirror, it doesn't see that it's been eaten at all. And I'm sorry, but that picture is very thought-provoking because how many of us feel like we've been all chewed up, right? How many of us feel like we've been chewed up and spit out, walked on and thrown around a little bit? And how many of us really actually are, you know? Yeah, everybody has their bumps and bruises. And some people like to try and compare and say, oh, my life's worse than yours and your life's worse than mine. Y'all, I get told every day by people who meet my children that they are so grateful. Or no, it's not that they're grateful. It's that they're like, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> I'm just like, well, I, I would like to think that if if you had children with disabilities, you, you would do the best you could too, you know? I mean, that's just all your person can do. You learn and you do the best you can. And I think sometimes that how you choose to view your situation and your, your thing in life, whether it's, you know, like me with disabled children or somebody else with a disability, you know, they can't walk or maybe someone else whose career isn't coming up off the ground and they don't know what to do or you know, someone else who's, you know, working so hard and not making enough money and, and doesn't know what else to do, or where to turn because there's no other options. It's about how you perceive it all. Are you going to look at yourself as the apple that's chewed up? Or are you going to look at yourself as the apple that's not chewed up, even though maybe you kind of are? If you view yourself as the apple that hasn't been chewed up, what's to say that God couldn't make you into what you view. Isn't it supposed to be that what we say, what we put out there is exactly what we become? So if we want to be that successful person, shouldn't we be saying, you know what? Things might not be always going the way I wanted to, but I think I'm the apple who's not chewed up because I, that's what I'm going to choose for myself right? How much of this is about what we put into it? How much of this is about how we're seeing it? Okay. So don't forget your ego is that 
is this is simply an idea of who you are that you carry around with you. Which one do you want to carry around with you? You're going to be the lion or the drowned cat? Are you going to be the apple that's whole or the apple that's eaten? It's all about how what you're going to choose to carry around with you. You have a choice. That's, all, that's what we we're just saying. You have a choice. Okay, so let's move this up here. So what's our choices? Basically, your ego is your set of opinions, biases, desires, and fears, all of which are born out of your life experiences. And we usually take all of this as true facts. But the truth is, there are very small perspectives of a very big reality, okay? And you can either choose to be a hostage to your ego or a host to God. This is the seat of your free will. And that is a question, my friends, that I have been asking for years. Where is the seat of my choice making, right? Even to the point of almost having like spiritual crisis because they couldn't figure that part out but you know what I love this because at a moment when I'm like not worrying about it and not concerned about it here comes Hashem with the answer so when I'm in a moment of peace he's like here you go the seat of your free will is do you choose to be held hostage by your ego or choose to be a host to God beautiful it's just beautiful and if you think about that for a minute it's right Choosing to be a host of God. Because what is Zim Zoom, right? We've talked about this before. God pulled himself in to make space for us. And then here on earth, we built him the temple to make space for him. And when the temple was torn down, we make space for him in our heart, in our life, in our every day. By saying our prayers, by reading the tefillin, by, um, by doing the mitzvahs, by studying Torah right? So let's talk about the picture. So you can either choose to be the puppet being controlled by your ego, or you can choose balance, examine your emotions and the choices that go with them and make the best choice. So I liked the picture of the woman holding up the, her two faces, her two emotions, because it's like she's stepping back in a moment of in, in, in inner peace and saying, I can do one of these two, which am I going to do? That my friends is that balance. That is that balance and that peace rather than being jerked around by your ego all the time. The, the second picture where she's holding up the two faces, that's what we want. We want to be able to look at what's going on around us. Yes, this is happening. How am I going to handle this? Am I going to choose to handle this with peace and good choices or am I going to choose to give into my ego and my emotions and freak out I mean the fact that you can stand back and have that to be able to look at it and choose that's huge all right <clears throat> expectations let's talk about expectations here okay so one of our biggest, one of the biggest ways that your ego runs your life is in the area of expectations. Your expectations are actually your subconscious ego desires. Okay. They are the shoulds in your life. Expectations don't serve you. They are resentments waiting to happen. The only thing you can expect for sure is that the outer layer of your life experiences will always be changing. Okay. When you learn to drop your expectations and to embrace deep acceptance and gratitude, you will find the joy and more, the joy and more energy will flow into you and your life. Okay. So I picked this picture of a mother overwhelmed with so she's got four children and a dog and her kitchen looks like it's been destroyed. Um, <laughs> the reason is because I don't know about you all, but me as a mom, my expectations are that my children would not do this to my kitchen. <laughs> However, I have been this mom. 
<laughs> and I know children can do lots of things you don't think they can. <laughs> and a lot of times we go into this stage of life. Oh, I have all these expectations. I'm going to be the mom who does this and does that and the other. And my children are going to be like this, that, and the other. But, you know, I've also listened to some rabbis who said, you know what? You don't get to um, shape your child into whoever you want to, them to be. No, you get the job of basically showing them the world, modeling for them how you do stuff. And that's about it. It's a privilege. You get to show them the world and how to do stuff if they actually choose to do those things, if they choose to live the same kind of life that you do, that's a blessing from Hashem because they're their own person and they're going to choose their own way. And so while you might have, you know, tried really hard to teach your kids, you know, don't climb on the counters, you still got one climbing on the counters. <laughs> There's only so much that you can do. And yes, while your children are, are younger, you can do, you know, more than you can with their older, but relationships change as they grow and they are their own person from day one. And it's a privilege to be able to have them in your life and to be that person who shows them the world and gets to model for them how to do stuff. But at the end of the day, they make their own choices. And that's something I think is really hard for a lot of parents to accept. If I'd only done this, that, and the other, well, I'm sorry, but you, there have been so many people who've tried so many different ways God gives you the child he gives you for a reason. He gives you those kids to not only be able to shepherd them into the world, give this soul another chance at life, but also to mirror to you yourself, to teach you compassion, to teach you um, empathy, the perspective of others, so many things. There's so many things that raising children teaches you. And it's messy and it's got really high highs and really low lows for your whole life after you've had them. I mean, it doesn't stop. So if you are um, allowing your ego to control your choice making and your expectations and all that, you're going to be a person who's upset a lot because there's going to be a whole lot of things that you should think happen don't happen. And things that you don't want to happen, oh yeah, they're going to happen. <laughs> because that's the thing. God has put us here to help us grow. And all the things that we get to go through, the good, the bad, the ugly, the beautiful, the tragic, the glorious, every last bit, every single detail is for your benefit. It's because God loves you more than you can understand, more than you can perceive. And because he loves you so much, he's taken you, this beautiful soul, and planted you in a, a container of clay so that you can grow your roots deep and strong and so that you can start shining that beautiful light of who you are out into the whole world and help redeem and make this world the place that Hashem intended it to be from the onset. Okay. <laughs> yes, there is a crystal ball in the background. So let's get to why. <laughs> um. You are not the person who determines the future. So now maybe you know why. <laughs> Expectations take the infinite potential of the future and form a picture of what it should be. If you guys remember last week's class, we talked a little bit about the whole thing with should and, and Atlas, right? And we talked about how just like Atlas tried to trick Hercules into carrying the whole world on his shoulders, your ego who's like Atlas, is going to try to trick you into carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders. Well, here we go. Here's another example of that. 
Expectations take the infinite potential of the future and form a picture of what it should be. Well, part of that's because we want to be able to dream, right? And it's kind of hard to dream if you can't envision it, right? But the thing about that is, is that envisioning it kind of limits you. And I never would have thought I'd say that before, <laughs> but it does. It kind of limits you because when you pin it all down into a nice tiny little package that looks appealing to you, what are you missing out on? You know, I used to think, oh, if only I had that teacher or if only I had that, you know, job or whatever, then I would have been this or I'd have had that or I'd have been happy or whatever. And then I started thinking of my prayers, but yeah, if I did have that job, then maybe I wouldn't have had this other thing that I did have because I didn't have that job. And then I started thinking, well, what if, what if I'm praying so specifically like that and I end up missing out on a bigger thing that Hashem wants to give me, but because I'm being so honed in on what I think it should be that I miss out completely because I wasn't willing to let Hashem show me his world. Just in the same way that we're supposed to show our kids the world, right? Instead of experiencing the wonder of what might flower into being in the forthcoming present, you are trapped in a vision of what you think your reality should be. Wow. Wow. By doing this, you are creating resistance to any other possibilities and you create pain and suffering for yourself and others. Wow, that's a huge statement. I'm sorry, but every one of these is a huge statement. It just, they really are. You're creating resistance by making this idea of what things should be like. Yeah, that's one thing to think, oh, it'd be lovely if this was, you know, whatever, but how married to you how married to your idea are you? Okay. Um, are you so stuck on one idea that you can't possibly allow for things to be different than your idea? That's kind of scary, but this is how the ego works, right? It's been said that E-G-O, ego is an acronym for edging God out. Remember it's I, the sense between you and God. Yeah. That ego trying so hard to push God out of the picture. And that's where we end up with this whole worshiping of self, right? Because isn't that what the ego tries to do? Arrogant, self-focused, a lot about the self here. When you think you understand the whole picture of on your own, you've made a decision that you know better than God regarding how things should develop. And that's what I was saying. Sometimes I think if I pray too specifically, I might, I might be ending up getting less than what God is trying to offer me. I think that's, that's my new, <laughs> I don't want to do that. Kind of scares me. I don't want to do that. You know, um, when we do this, we forget that there is intention behind all things in life. And that literally is an all, all things in life. There's intention behind it. And this intention is for your highest good. Not only that, but we open ourselves up for major disappointment. It is perfectly normal and natural for us to have expectations. It's also true that your life without them engenders more peace. So the question becomes whether you choose to maintain the way you viewed reality your whole life or decide to let go of the undesirable perspectives. Wow, so much deep stuff. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about wanting. I thought this picture was perfect <laughs> to show wanting. I mean, what kid doesn't look at a tray of cookies and want them, right? Is there anything wrong with wanting? No. <laughs> uh, but let's let's think it through for a bit. Um, why do you want most of the things you want? 
Most of the times is because you want to feel a certain way. And we all want to feel safe and secure and taken care of. And we all want to feel love and joy and connection. We want to feel valuable, worthy, and good. And we want to feel authentic, genuine, and kind. And this is what we call wholeness. And on a deeper level, it's what we call holiness. And at some level, we feel that we're missing something. Like something's wrong and there's a problem. And something, some things, sorry, sometimes this is expressed as a feeling of not being good enough, shame, inauthenticity, sadness, feeling alone, weak, scared, or altogether lacking and empty. As a result, our desire for more wholeness increases. So what happens, okay? We attempt to fill the void with things or satiate our desires uh, with change of identity. We grab onto material things, wealth, social status, power, relationships, physical pleasure, and new experiences. And I don't know about you, but that one bullet point right there sounds a whole lot to me like Ecclesiastes, where where Solomon is going through saying it's all meaningless, right? Inevitably, we fail and fall back onto square one, or we achieve our goals and grieve because we feel like we are missing something. Can you imagine that? Working so hard to get somewhere and do something And once you're there and you got it, you're sad. Who does that? A person whose ego is in control, that's who. And unfortunately, that's a lot of us. That's a lot of us. Not long after we are back on our search for wholeness. This is how most of us go through life most of the time. For many, the pain becomes so great that we develop addictions, obsessions, and other psychological challenges, such as depression and anxiety. And people will go to great lengths to numb the pain, quiet the fear, and feed the desire. This is the ego, the yatahara, the underdeveloped perspective, looking for love in all the wrong places. I chose this picture of one person in the middle of a bunch of people, because honestly, that's what loneliness is. You're in a sea of people, you have people all around you, and you still don't feel connected. And why is that? Well, we just learned it's because of our ego. So I wanted to make a comparison at this point, because this is... I don't know, this movie has become a really uh, favorite of mine, but this is from, these pictures are from the movie, um, The Greatest Showman, about one of my um, uh, ancestors, P.T. Barnum. And in the first picture, uh, this character um, in The Greatest Showman wouldn't be content with the life that she was given. And let's see if I can... Oh, yeah, I can. I don't know if it does that on your end of it, but the words, the, the, the crux of the song that she sings is, uh, take, uh, take my hand. Will you share this with me? Cause darling, without you, all the shine of a thousand spotlights, all the stars we steal from the night sky will never be enough. The, uh, never, uh, Never be enough. Towers of gold are still too little. These hands that hold the world. These hands could hold the whole world, but it will never be enough. Okay. So that, that character's whole thing is nothing will ever be enough. I have to keep going, going, going. And even to the point of trying to take another woman's husband At some point, I'm sure he would never be enough if he went along with that, right? This person's never satisfied because this person's driven by their ego. The second person, the one I want to compare her to, 
is the bearded lady. And the bearded lady's crux of her song, which her whole song is amazing and will give you goosebumps. But the crux of her song says, <clears throat> when the sharpest words want to cut me down, I'm going to send a flood, going to drown them out. I am brave. I am bruised. I am who I'm meant to be. This is me. Look out, because here I come. And I'm marching on the beat that I drum. I'm not scared to be seen. I make no apologies. This is me. And I think that that is exactly the kind of peace that we need to have. That woman had a very hard life. Actually, both of these women had a very hard life because the first woman was, you know, born illegitimately. And so she had been experiencing that being ostracized into the world she was born in right? The second woman had a very different upbringing, not the high class society, very low class society, but just as ostracized in her life because of her physical deformity. Where one woman, nothing would ever be enough. The other woman's like, I am okay with who I am because God made me this way. Watch out world, here I come. And I think that's the key here to this equanimity is being able to accept who God made you and, and to be able to accept what he has presented to you and say, yes, this is the life God gave me. What choices can I make in this? And, and am I going to choose the perspective of the ego who's constantly focused on things like how it feels and all of that stuff, or am I going to be focused on the bigger goal, the tikkun olam, the, the doing the mitzvahs of Hashem, the prayers, the, the tefillin, all of it, the treating my fellow man as I would treat myself. Is that what our focus is going to be? This is our choice, right? Okay. So the problem here is, is that we're running into something that our author calls the if there then distortion. So I had lots of fun with these little arrows. <laughs> and I tried to recreate what he did in his book. So the first part of the if there then distortion is increased desire to feel whole. Leads us to the if there then distortion, which is the search for wholeness, which leads to an increased feeling of lack. And goes right back up to this increased desire for wholeness. So basically what you're creating is a funnel. A funnel. Starts out big, gets smaller, and it goes down. Right? Um, why do we get stuck in this pointless cycle? It's because we have a distorted view of reality in which we think that wholeness is, well, if I get this there, then... Blankety blank, 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 right? Um, if things are different or when I get there or when when it's now, not now, but then. We are addicted to the past and the future, the good old days and the dream life. But the thing is, is we need to do the path less traveled, right? Um we need to end up taking, we end up taking a, a, a wrong turn away from truth and detour into falsehood. And unfortunately, that's what a lot of people do. So it's a very well-traveled path. Many of us end up stuck in the cycle and some of us become so broken by that cycle that we often, through trauma, does Hashem give us that divine direction into the path of enlightenment, which is that less traveled path and after looking for love in all the wrong places we realize that it's already right where we are it, it's like it's like someone being so stuck in their idea of how things should be that when you don't agree with them they'll say well i'll you know let me know when you come back to grace I'm sorry, I don't see a single human being alive today or ever in all eternity who could possibly ever 
step outside of God's grace. The simple fact that he nourishes all flesh. He takes care of the needs of every human being. Without fail. When you think about that for a minute. And you trust that he's got you. You realize how much love he's pouring into you. Yeah, he hears you. He understands. He knows what you want. He knows the things you are looking for. He knows the kind of things you're trying to achieve. And he also knows the very best way to get you there. The question is, are you going to open your eyes and see what's right in front of you? And I don't know about you guys. Sometimes I have a really hard time seeing All right, so we kind of touched on this a couple of slides ago, but <clears throat> wouldn't you say it's good to strive for something great in your life? Well, of course, sure. There's nothing wrong with striving except for the fact that you may never be arriving. You can work really hard for something all day long, but if that's not what God had intended for you, it ain't gonna happen. When I was much, much younger, um, a person who at that time in my life had, you know, a lot of influence said, you know what, if you and so-and-so are meant to be, nothing in all the world will keep you apart. But if you're not meant to be, everything in the world will keep you apart. And that is so true. That's that whole point. You can, you can strive all day long. You just got to accept sometimes you might not be arriving to where you think you're supposed to be going. People like to ask, what would you do today if you knew that tomorrow you were going to die? And our author challenges us to kind of flip that perspective. Instead, he says we should ask ourselves, what if I had everything I want today? What would I do with, you know, do if all my desires were fulfilled? Who would I be? If my fears were removed, what would be left of me if I achieved all the success I desired and had nothing to be afraid of? Those are some deep questions. And I really, really want you guys to take some time to think about them and maybe even journal them, your answers to them. Because so much of what consumes our minds, so much of what consumes us every day are somehow related to those questions. Whether it's something we want, something we need, something we're afraid is going to happen, something we don't have and, oh no, what will happen if I don't get it? <clears throat> but think about your answers to these questions. This could be one of the most important exercises that you do. And the answers to these questions will point you in the direction of your true self. So remember your, your ego, your yatahara, that's not your true self. The answer to these questions, that, that's your true self. So remember we were talking before about so much of your soul is not in your body, right? The only things in your body are these three right here. And these are the three smallest parts, the neshima, the ruach, and the nefesh. These are in your body. The neshima goes to Shem every night when you go to sleep. So the Ruach and the Nefesh stay, right? The Chaya surrounds your body. It's like an aura. And the Yehida, I think I'm saying that right, Yehida is what's actually with Hashem. And the very bulk of who you are is in this Yehida right here. It's the bulk of who you are. So all of this is very tiny bit of who you are, but this up here, the top part is the biggest part of who you are. And you remember from um, the previous book, when we talked about like the, the wheel and the, the, the spoke, um, the, what they call that, the hub, like the hub cap or whatever, the center of the wheel. And then you have the spokes that go out to the tire, right? 
And so if you move one of those spokes just a tiny little bit down here, it makes a huge movement out here, right? So every little thing that we do here in this world where we can create and we can do, it actually has this massive impact in this area of our soul, in the bigger part of the reality, in the bigger part of the who we are. Tiny little steps we make here have enormous impacts there. Okay, so the Talmud says, what should a man do if he wants to live? Kill himself. The Talmud is not advocating suicide. The Talmud is talking about your ego and that you are, you know, that you, that you are convinced is you. Kill your false sense of self. And we've all heard this before. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Rabenu, Rabenu Jonah Garondi described this in his classic works, or his classic work, Gates of Return, as the ability to die before you die. This is a very big concept dear to most of our hearts. Psalms 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. You know, you, you delight yourself in him and he will delight, you know, you, you make his will your will and he will make your will his will, right? And we've also heard in um, Luke that, you know, Yeshua of Nazareth said that he who, he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny it themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me. Well, taking up your cross was a way of dying, right? So die daily. This is talking about the same thing. It's, it's killing off that ego, you know, putting it into balance. Just the same way that we have to do so with our arrogance versus our humility, right? We don't want to have no arrogance at all. And we're not supposed to completely get rid of our Yisahara. We're supposed to teach it, right? Our soul is supposed to teach this immature, underdeveloped perspective how to do things the right way. Instead of letting it be the two-year-old child who gets away with whatever it wants, we need to take that ego in hand and teach it and train it to be mature. Well, how do you do that? By practicing equanimity. Not allowing it to have everything at once when it wants it. Yes, you can have a donut once in a while, but not a dozen every day. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. And again, so I use this picture again, because when, when you plant a seed in the ground, the seed has to die in order for the plant to grow and make more seeds that then get planted and have to die in order to make the plant grow. And it just keeps going and going in that cycle. Are you willing to let that ego die a little so that you can grow? That's the big question. Oh, yes, he knew had this had to come up at some point, right? <laughs> Abandon your need for things to be the way you think they should be. It is the attachment to a false reality that perpetuates pain and frustration. Ego is invested with bias and opinion. Experiencing sameness removes this bias. Okay. Instead of having your personal prejudices, I like to think of it as a soapbox, being in favor or against whatever issue. You can allow things to be as they are while striving to align yourself with something that runs deeper than opinions. Abandon favoring and opposing and develop the complete openness to experience without being enveloped in like and dislike. So experience what's going on without making that judgment of, is this good or bad? Do I like it or don't like it? Because it's so subjective. 
and you don't know all the variables. Maybe it feels good to you, but it might cause you to have a heart attack later on and die. That would not be good, right? So, you know, he, he has used examples before about, you know, you've got the person who doesn't want to stop doing his drugs or the woman who doesn't want to stop eating the high fructose corn syrup and like, yeah, but I don't want to deny myself pleasure. Well, you know, you got to take all those things into, into consideration. And abandon favoring and opposing and develop complete openness to experience without being developed or sorry, enveloped with like and dislike. Only once you given up your biases, are we able to experience life without being hooked by desire or aversion? So either we're trying to get it or trying to run away from it. Instead of that, instead of all that crazy yo-yo mess, we need to be able to experience it as it's happening, acknowledge that it's happening and say, what is the best thing I can choose right now? And choose that and keep moving forward. I chose this picture of the matrix because what is the real reality? And that was the whole point of that movie, right? What was real? What was really real? You know, it was, was the steak the guy was eating that he knew wasn't real, but it sure did taste good. Well, how many times do we get so enveloped in the, the, crazy material things of this world that we forget that this isn't all of reality. This is actually the very smallest part, the most corrupted part, the most in need of God part, right? All the other worlds, all the other sephirot are higher elevations, but it's in this sephirot, the very bottom one, that we can have an impact, that we can make a difference that we can create, that we can do, that we can actually go about the efforts of Tikkun Olam, repairing the universe. Where the ego divides, love connects. This isn't indifference. It's a life fully engaged with the love that is embedded within reality. The simplicity and lack of ego investment define the core of humanity. When you think of a person that exudes humility, what stands out about them is not that they think they are worthless or that they're constantly praising others. It's that they seem to see themselves as no better or worse than anyone else. They see through a lens of sameness. They know that they are that we are all made equal in God's image and that we are all the same and we are all equally powerful in our ability to shine light into this world. So that is what I have for you guys for tonight. I would love to hear your opinions or views or insights or things that stood out to you, anything that you've noticed or that touched your heart, please go ahead and feel free to unmute your mic and let me know what you think. Oops. I did something. Ah, there we go. Anybody want to talk? It reminded me of my son who, uh, when he was 16, was, was telling us how he felt about things and that he would always feel that way. It would never change. Oh, my <laughs> word. <laughs> it was, and we couldn't help but laugh. Tommy and I were, couldn't help but laugh, which wasn't the best thing, but it was like, Oh, you have so much life to experience. <laughs> and I think we can sometimes get stuck there, even in our own. You're right. I think we can. We can very much get stuck there on our own. You need to wait, buddy. Sorry. Sorry, okay. everybody. 
Um, the thing is, is you're right. Cause when we're, when we're young, we, we can't, we can't look beyond that. It's, it's like our experiences are so narrow and we think, Oh, nothing mm -hmm. will ever change my mind on this until you get to about two years down the road. And then your whole, whole mind has changed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It, mm -hmm. was a, it was a pleasant memory at this point of, in life to remember that and think, well, yes. And I can remember thinking very similar to that even at, even after I got a little bit, lived a little bit that yeah. oh yeah this is how it's always gonna be well no it's not how it's always gonna be <laughs> like I don't know about you guys but I I'm not super fond of things changing I'm like everything's constantly <laughs> changing we need to stop we need constantly. some stability <laughs> yeah and I don't know that we're gonna find a lot of that today <laughs> probably not Probably not, but being able to, to be at peace no matter what happens is the goal, right? Yes, reminding us who is really in charge. Yeah. Um. Hold on just a second. My son's still having a hard time. Hold on. Sorry. Oh my goodness. All right. No <laughs> it's life interesting, that's for sure. Um, anybody anybody mm. else have a comment they want to make? It's okay if you don't. Just saying, giving you an opportunity. All right, last chance. All right, everybody, it was wonderful. To be able to have this class tonight. I'm so grateful that Miss Elizabeth could come out and join us. And Miss Miss mm -hmm. Adas is here too. Just a little shy yeah. tonight. It's okay. <laughs> um it was next very week. enjoyable. And I will have to go back and do this. I will have to go back and rerun this again because there there was so much to take in. Yeah, and you definitely want to read the chapter too, because I did not put literally every word in here that he did. And because I'm trying to be able to give you guys a more of a synopsis, but so much of what he says is like, mm -hmm. like I said before, it's like every line is a, is a hit to the gut. And so it's like, he's just mm -hmm. like, punch, 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 punch. And you're just sitting here going, I can't take this all in. So yeah. definitely go back and read the chapter very carefully and spend that time ruminating on it. Be a cow, chew it, mm -hmm. swallow, spit it back up, chew some more, <laughs> swallow. He'll do that for a while, you know, because literally every line he gives us is, is mm. <sighs> solid gut punches, man. Solid gut punches. Mm -hmm. All I gotta say. You know, I hope everybody can come out yeah. for Shabbos service this Saturday at uh, Maganishiano. We will be in Bedford, Texas at 10 o'clock for service. And if you can't, we are on YouTube. Uh, we usually have our, our service live on YouTube. So please feel free to join yes. us either way you can. And um, hopefully we'll see you back next week. We will be doing chapter five. Mm -hmm which is living sameness. So I very much look forward to that. And we will see you guys all. Oh my God, I probably have to. Oh, how do I do this? Do I, how do I just hit this button? Oh, wait, stop the share. Okay, there we go. Stop the share and we will see you all next week.